Well, uh, we'd like to say welcome to another jam-packed edition of On The Whistle podcast. And today we are lucky, and we are not always lucky to be this lucky, <laughs> to have an export from South Africa who's working in Europe, from the known <laughs> four places in South Africa, Benoni. I cannot believe it. Alan Clark, the much-traveled, heavily football-educated analyst. Welcome to the On The Whistle podcast. Shame, Courtney. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, thank you to you and Alistair for having me as well. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you guys. Thanks so much. So we are CM, yeah, as you just said, myself and Alistair, we are supporting each other in the opportunity to talk to yourself today. And we, we are grateful to have you, as I said, um, to give us your time and also your flexibility. I must say, I was a bit late. I'm so sure. But Alistair, do you want to go with the first question? Because I'm, I'm still amazed by this first question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess, Alan, you know, obviously looking at, at your kind of background, your experience, you know, we've got the, some of the big hitters in South Africa, you know, your Sundowns, your, your Super Sports, you know, Yamazulu, Black Leopards, etc. And then suddenly I see you jump from that to, to Kef Blacky. I, I don't know if I'm saying it right, and then working with the, the Federation of, of the Kosovo under 21 team. Yeah. yeah. You know, how, how does how does a man come from kind of coaching in the PSL and, and working in South Africa to, to finding himself in, in Kosovo? Yeah, interesting question, Alistair. It's, um, it, it started out a little bit before uh, 2020, actually. In 2017, I was approached by the technical director of the Football Federation here in Kosovo, uh, a Michael Nis, who was the technical director of SAFA previously, um, to come out and assist him uh, in assisting the youth national teams um, because they had just been admitted into UEFA and FIFA for the first time, Kosovo. Um, obviously, this is after their independence uh, from the old Yugoslavia and Serbia, and uh, they really needed a lot of help. Uh, you can imagine, obviously, after, after the war, there was a lot of uh, infrastructure that was lacking that needed improvement but also uh, knowledge um, you know Europe is an unforgiving place in football so you're up against countries that have history steep steeps of history in terms of their their legacy and their their performances and uh, yeah there's no mercy so when you play these big teams and uh, you play against them you suffer if you're not well prepared um, and so he got me on board during the FIFA weeks initially uh, just to come out and help the team prepare um, because we wanted to move up the rankings as much as possible. We were very lucky, actually. Um, before I'd come, our, the other 21s had played against Norway. Martin Udegaard uh, was Real Madrid player at that stage, was the captain, and they had previously lost 5-0 against uh, Norway and I think 3-0 against the Republic of Ireland. So... Michael contacted me and said, Alan, please come on board. Let's see what we can do. We need to help. Uh, so I came out. Uh, Amazulu were very gracious, allowed me to travel uh, to assist Kosovo. And um, yeah, we prepared the team as best we could. And we managed to turn it around. We actually secured Kosovo's first ever victory of any kind in international football with a 3-2 win against the same Norway that we had lost 5-0 to. Um, and we were 2 0 down at half time. So it was a great turnaround result. Uh, and then we traveled to Germany, and uh, at that stage, we were world champions. And uh, we lost 1 0, um, which was an incredible feat. It's hard to say about a loss, but uh, you were playing the world champions at that stage. Uh, everybody expected us to lose by eight, and we, we sort of held our own. Uh, and then in the return leg, we managed to get a 0 0 draw. So we, we I was really blessed in that. We really got a, a, an incredible, um, talented team. And I got to work with them. They were very open to all of the suggestions to become more professional. Um, and we got success. Uh, sometimes you can do all the right things and you don't get success. And then uh, it seems like whatever you, the advice you gave was, wasn't was worth it. But it sort of, it really paid off. The football gods were, were smiling a little bit. And then sort of carried on with my career uh, back in South Africa. Um, and, and then I had the opportunity of Black Leopards as the head coach. And COVID hit. 
And just before I returned to the bubble, I, I got a phone call out of the blue um, from a club that was in the Superliga, um, KF Loppy, and had ambitions of playing in Europe in the European Continental competitions. And they made me an offer to come and work with them as, as the first coach for the senior side. Uh, and it kind of just spiraled from there. Obviously, being in the country then, I had a good legacy and a good uh, working relationship already with the federation. And the opportunity to work with the other 21s came along and I jumped at it. So that's how I ended up in Kosovo. <laughs> An amazing journey. Um, I, when, when I listen to you, obviously you say Amazulu, Amazulu gives you the opportunity to go over um, and, and, and ply your trade in Europe, which a lot of managers struggle with. Mm. Yes, you are in the minnows of Europe, but you are here now, mm. playing your trade. Let's just do a bit of a rewind here. Sure. Give us a bit of historical background of how you got into coaching in football, because I've been following some of your analysis, especially like your analysis of the Spurs game. You must remember, I've also got my own my own uh, problem with the, your analysis of the Spurs game that you put up. I've, I've, I've looked at that. I'm going to challenge you on something. Gladly. Uh, yeah. Let's let's go with your. How did you get into this managerial um, role that you're currently in? Where did it start? Well, it's, it's quite a long journey, if I'm honest with you, Courtney. But um, uh, obviously, like many young South Africans, um, I played football at a very young age at, at my community club in Benoni, <laughs> at Old Benoni. <laughs> hold on, hold on, Alistair <laughs> Benoni. I can't get past that, Alistair. I don't know how to equate Benoni to. <laughs> I don't know anyone, or do you know a yes. pro ball that came out of Benoni? Yeah, Ryan Sanandi, Bafana Bafana, Cars the Chiefs, Charlize okay. Theron, the Princess of Monaco. Uh, there's some big names coming out. <laughs> yes, Charlize Theron that said there's only 40 people that speak Afrikaans left in the country. Yeah, all of, I mean, well, <laughs> most of them live in Benoni. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I speak Afrikaans and I'm from Peter Marisburg. Oh, She's from this. Sorry, cut to no, no, it's fine. Yeah, it's, no, we've had some a few celebrities from Benoni, so yeah. Uh, anyway, shame, but yes, Benoni, <laughs> a very proud Benonian. But uh, play play football, and um, I had an opportunity actually to go to England um, on trials at Crystal Palace in Reading, and um, I was doing quite well there in the youth side, and I had a very bad injury to my knee. Um, I was only nineteen, and I had to stop football completely. I wasn't able to continue. Um, I had numerous surgeries and I just wasn't able to to play any, anymore. So I started to study for my coaching badges. I came back to South Africa, started doing all my coaching licenses. Uh, I also got myself educated. I have a degree in psychology and sociology um, and I also studied teaching. So I went into education. I was the head of sport at a primary school for, for about 12 years. Um, and in that time, it gave me a really good grounding in terms of working with development and youth within South Africa um, and allowed me to study my coaching licenses and my coaching badges um, and working, for instance, with the youth, like I say, was such a good uh, foundation for me. Um, it was good because of the, the different cultures that we have in South Africa. It was good because of the developmental stages that you get at each age. Um, and I feel like it really gave me a good foundation to move into professional sports um, and something I always had ambition to do as a player and then obviously as a coach. Uh, and then it got to a stage actually after my coaching licenses, after I got my A license, I was invited by SAFA to become a coach educator on the first pro license that was held in South Africa. Um, so I actually gave a lecture on video analysis and technical analysis. It was still very rudimentary at that stage, um, and not really introduced to South Africa just yet. Um, and the national team head coach was part of the course, uh, Mr. Pizzomo Samani. And after my lecture, he literally called me to his table and said, Alan, tomorrow I need you to report to camp, uh, with the national team. I, I thought he was joking if I was honest with you. And uh, the next day, I uh, saw if a bus arrived oh, at my house. Glenn, hold on, hold on. It happened that easy. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> what? You must have been fantastic in there. <laughs> the, the, the manager says to you, stop what you're doing, report to camp. Yeah. You've been so And that's how <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. And the next day, what it was. a staff of bus pitch rocked up in my house, collected me and took me off to um, Royal Buffalo King in, in Rustenburg. That was brilliant. That was this. And it was my first professional job in football. And uh, South Africa played against Egypt. Um, Pizzo employed me as a as a tactical coach uh, doing the analysis. Uh, if you remember that game, it's the first game South Africa ever beat Egypt in a an official game. We won the game 1-0 with a Katlevo and Pele goal. And uh, yeah, the rest, the rest they say is history. And, and it sort of progressed from there going into club management and things like that. But that's really how I got involved into into coaching um, and into football full time. So, so listen, I, I'm just going to go back. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the first job in football is with the national team. Yeah. The A national team at, at that, not even the junior. It was, it was surreal. You are at the pinnacle in your first job. Yeah. And we won. <laughs> we beat. It's like <laughs> having the thing all on day one. <laughs> yeah, crazy. It, oh, it's. it's uh, you know, sometimes you look back and, and, and I have a look at it and I just recently did an interview about it and it's sometimes you have to pinch yourself because it is it is surreal. Sometimes you don't you don't always take or you don't always give great uh, gratitude for what you've had and what you've achieved and all the experiences that you've been uh, involved in. And yeah, absolutely. Incredible, incredible opportunity and it really came out of nothing. And Alan, when you were doing that kind of your first gig, I mean, we've had Pizzo on the podcast a few times and, you know, he, he's such you know, a footballing genius in many ways, but he's so intense. He knows what he's doing. He, you know, he does the research. You know, what was it like working for him, you know, in the big job at, you know, obviously we know it didn't quite work out for him for the national team, but, you know, he's gone on to see such success. You know, what was it like working under him, you know, as, as such a young guy yourself? Well, first it was a culture shock and I was starstruck for about the first two, three days. Uh, you're walking around and you've got Steven Pinar and uh, uh, Tumal and Kune walking around the place and sitting having breakfast with these guys. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm a Spurs fan and Steven Pinar and Bongani Kamalo are, are sitting sitting there with me on the bus. First, I don't, I think the first two, three days were a blur, to be honest with you. Um, and then something I always, I always remind my, uh, a lot of my players is that up until that time, I'd never drunk a cup of coffee in my whole life. I'd never drank coffee, but you speak about how intense and how in depth and how, um, hard working pizza is, is that from that camp, it's the only way I survived was to drink coffee because I said it's about two, three hours a night. It was unbelievable. There's a, there's a little coffee machine in the room in the Royal Buffalo King, in the Royal Morong Hotel. I think that, I think I might've broken mine. I, it was the only way I was staying up with pizza. He was unbelievable work ethic. Um, he had phone two, three in the morning, Alan, I need you to see this. Come look. What do you think? We hit the man literally doesn't sleep. He, he really is a workaholic. He's really intense. He's passionate about football. Um, for, for a young guy to learn from a, a coach like that, it, it was incredible. We had the Brazilian coaches around as well. So for me as a learning experience, yeah, I don't think you can put money on us. Alan, that's, that's unbelievable. You know, um, that is an experience people will pay yeah. big money for yeah. and afforded it at the beginning of your managerial career, which is fantastic. You know, you, you can just almost besides feel the experience, you can hear the experience that you were afforded. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. With, with this experience, with this knowledge and with Pizzo's guidance. How have you taken that experience into what you're currently doing in Kosovo? Well, I think not only with Pizzo, but with, with all the coaches that I've had a working relationship with, I think you, you, you kind of take a bit from everybody. Um, again, I, I mean, I've worked with, uh, and for a very long period, uh, Kevin Johnson, who, who I think is an incredible coach, um, and just as hardworking, just as passionate unbelievable knowledge of the game and, and such a such a passion for the youth in South Africa as well and you just take those little bits and pieces and you learn from them I think each of us in our own right have our own personality but 
you, you take little things that sort of align with your personality and your way of thinking, uh, and you steal, uh, you steal a little bit from each of them. Um, you, you take away the good bits that Pizzo has in terms of his hard work and his passion and his, his thirst for knowledge. Um, Kevin's unbelievable man management skills and, and the way that he deals with his players um, and just what an all-round incredible human being he is. Um, and and you, you, for me, I try to take little bits of that to incorporate into my own personality, um, which I incorporate then onto, onto the field um, and onto my players as well. Um, I think all of it sort of sets you up on the path and the journey that you're on. So I, I try and learn from everybody, good good and bad, sometimes what to do and sometimes not what to do. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's fascinating to hear. You know, one thing I want to ask, yeah. kind of, you're now in Kosovo and, you know, we talk a lot on the podcast about the state of football in South Africa and how, you know, things maybe aren't where people want them to go, whether it's PSL or the national side, you know, but for us, we have no frame of reference for what, what it's like in Kosovo. You know, what is the kind of infrastructure like that you're working with in the national team, but also with Latvia, you know, club level, you know, what has it been like, you know, moving from South Africa to Kosovo? You know, how is it different? How does it compare the kind of footballing culture, the infrastructure? Yeah, what's, how does it compare? So I think from, from a cultural point of view, um, I think South Africans, sometimes we use the words maybe too broadly that we love football. Um, because until you see the passion and, and until you see the fanaticism that you get in Europe for football, then you really understand that people really love football. Um, uh, people will give everything and anything to be involved in football in, in Kosovo. It, there's a real um, passion, a real a real love for, for the game culturally. Um, you know they've they, they've had a national team that's been semi successful in in some moments in terms of their a national team, um, but obviously because of the war, there's a lot of infrastructure that was lacking, uh, that the federation and the uh, UEFA and the government have really tried very hard to improve. Um, South Africa, we are blessed with incredible facilities compared to the rest of Europe. Um, and, and I think I was the head of youth at Platinum Stars and, and the facility that we had at the Royal Buffalo King, it's, you don't get those kind of facilities anywhere in the world. I think now when you have a look at the top facilities in the world, then you start to see more or less what, what, um, Platinum Stars had, um, here they, because of the weather, they hey, sorry, yeah, go sorry, no, no disrespect. No, 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 go for it. Well, as we know, and uh, as South African, uh, Alistair being Kenyan, uh, being African, the country's not going through a wonderful period. Mm, yeah. But so you just said something now. We have facilities unlike anywhere else. Yeah. And is that really true? Because yeah. Is there a diamond mine just not being discovered there? It was... I, I was talking to a few... Uh, someone else last week, Mandela's one, who said... The facilities at Stellenbosch United are unlike something he's ever seen. Yeah. So, Alistair was talking to us. He was at the um, the Women's Confederation Cup yeah. about two years ago, Alistair, in Morocco. And he was saying the facilities there are unbelievable. So, so uh, look, I mean, with the national team, I, I can tell you from my experiences, not only here in Kosovo, but around Europe, the facilities that we have in South Africa are unbelievable compared to what they have. Now I've played I've played in England. We played at the MK Don Stadium. Okay. Home of football England it's it's incredible. But I've played in the Czech Republic. I've played in Azerbaijan. I've played in Israel. I've played in Kosovo. I've played in Albania. Uh I've I've been to UEFA. Um the under seventeens we had to play at Neon at UEFA's facility. And we have better facilities than what they had. I I'm categorically telling you that. So uh, it's sad to see, I, I wouldn't say we have a diamond mine undiscovered. We have a diamond mine that's been built that no one wants to use, um, because the facility is there and it works. Um, it's just been neglected. No, nobody takes care of our facilities. Um, and it's nice to have the building, but if we, we're not filling it with, with, with the important stuff. And that's the football, um, in Kosovo, for instance. Uh, the majority of the fields are artificial pitches. Um, whereas in South Africa, 
we play on natural turf 99% of the time. I joke with them here in Kosovo and I tell them this is artificial pitches, what we play on for the, the pup team at five side football. We don't play on artificial pitches, we play on grass. Um, they don't, they play on artificial pitches. And that in itself causes so many problems for them. Um, you have the most horrific youth injuries I've ever seen in my life that you normally get later on in players' careers. But because they're playing on AstroTurf all the time, at 14, 15, 16, they're having ACL uh, injuries, they're having knees and surgeries at 16 years old. You don't get this in South Africa because of the facilities. But uh, we, we're we not using it like they use it. Um, I think our national team stadium here in Kosovo holds about, I don't want to lie to you, but I think the most is about maybe four or 5,000. And uh, there's some high schools in South Africa that probably have stadiums bigger than what they have in terms of their rugby stadium, easily. Um, you know, um, and I think there's only, if I'm if I'm wrong, there's only one floodlit stadium in the whole country. So there's only one, the national team stadium, that can play matches at night, everybody else isn't. Um, South Africa, I think the majority of our stadiums are floodlit, and this was before the World Cup. So, I mean, the legacy of the World Cup is there, yes, but in, in other senses, there was a lot of infrastructure before the World Cup as well. We've got to be honest with ourselves as South Africans. Um, from a footballing point of view, um, look, they, they have a lot of challenges in terms of... The biggest challenge that they have is because of the war that the majority of the of the people left. Um, so there's about, I think, 2.8 million Kosovans living outside of Kosovo and only 1.6 living inside of Kosovo. So the majority live in the diaspora. Um, so it's a very small country, but unbelievably talented players. I Incredibly skilled players. Um, they have a lot, in my opinion, a lot to learn and a lot to develop from a tactical point of view. But uh, I do work with UEFA in terms of coaches' education, and I see that a lot of their problems come from a poor coaches' education system that's slowly starting to improve. So. They'll only start to benefit from that in the next five, 10 years in terms of their development programs. Um, but you have a look at Kosovan players around the world um, and even the Kosovo national team. It's a decent national team. Uh, I think Bafana Bafana would struggle to hold their own against the a Kosovan side with uh, Morici in goals, Vedat Morici at Mallorca. You've got Milo Rashica, who's now in, in um, Turkey but was at Norwich City before, and before that in the Bundesliga. Um, Akhmir Rahmani is the captain of the national team, is the captain of Napoli, currently top of the table in Serie A. So the quality of players is really at a high level. Um, and even for under-21s, um, at the under-21 level, we, I had players or have players from Inter Milan. Um, I have players from Fulham, I have players from Dundee, I have players from Switzerland, I have players from Sweden, and all top top level teams. So uh, the level, it, it, they yeah, some really, really good players. Um, you've got quite, got a youngster out in uh, Hamburg, Fadil Aslani, who's uh, already with the first team in, um, in Germany and scoring goals for them, and I think he's only 20, so... A lot of talented players in Kosovo. A lot. If I'm not mistaken, um, is Xhaka yeah. as well as Zerdan Sh the short Zerdan Shakiri. Yeah. Kosovan as well. Yeah, they are Kosovan. Um, uh, I think I, I must just be correct on this. I know Zerdan Shakiri 100%. Um, he's from Kosovo. Um, he's from a little town, Malisheva, down the road from me, about 40 minutes drive. Uh, Zidane Shakiri, I'm not sure if he's Albanian or Kosovan, but <clears throat> obviously culturally they have a link with Albania, but um, Zidane Shakiri 100% is Kosovan, yes. So there's a culture, there's a pedigree of quality players that, you know, mm. that have gone before them and are doing it at the moment. But I just, I just want to come back... Um, to, to to yourself at, at the moment. Okay. As one of the few South African managers 
and very few that are outside of the country applying their trade. Yeah. Do you think you would look for a job further in Europe because you're not just holding a CAF qualification, you're holding a, a UEFA qualification with a, with a large pedigree behind you of experience in a national team, youth developments. So do you think you'll look for a head job somewhere else? Yeah, I think uh, it's important to always always try and get yourself involved in projects where you feel you can you can make a difference. Um, the reason why I came to Kosovo is because I saw there was potential and I felt like I could make a difference here. Um, I felt like I have made a difference here. And I think when I look out at, at what your next or my next steps will be, it's always looking at, at where I can have the best opportunity to grow and to make a difference in an, in, in a in a football club or with a, nat- a national team. So uh, I haven't really thought about I'd like to stay in Europe or I'd like to go here or I'd like to go back to South Africa. I have very much enjoyed being in Europe. I have very much enjoyed the professional elements and environment that's here. I've enjoyed the players. Um, you get a very different type of mentality with regards to training the players in Europe. Um, almost very different from South Africa and I've enjoyed that I've enjoyed that a lot if I have the opportunity to stay here or to move to another European country and it's a good project yeah then then I, I'd like to stay if there's a good project in in Asia or in in Africa um, that allows me to make a difference and to grow you know then it's something I've considered I've never thought I've never been one scared to make a a giant leap um, and it's not about where it is, it's about what, what the opportunity is and, and um, how much I can grow what, and if I can make a difference too. I mean, Alan, on the list of places, you know, you sound like you want to move, you know, you can move wherever it is, is that project and you seem really keen on that idea, you know, would you consider moving, moving back to South Africa? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> your home's your home. Um, I miss my home. I know, obviously, I still have family there. Um, and, you know, I know the country is going through problems. You know, I'd like to be part of, like Nelson Mandela says, be part of the solution um, and be the change um, or be a little part of the change if I could. But I think it would really have to be a project, like I say, that I could feel like I could make a difference. Um, a project that I think also um, I could grow with as well i don't want to be the same coach i was that today that i can be tomorrow um there was part of the reason me coming to europe i felt like uh the psl was every it's just going round and round and it's very stagnant in terms of growth and i wanted to grow and i wanted to learn and have something different i, I felt like i needed something different so yeah i mean if something came up alistair in south africa or kenya and it was a good a good project and uh, an ambitious project, yeah, why not? Um, hopefully, they saw that load shedding before then, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, let me tell you, you won't be getting a, a great project in Kenya anytime soon. I'm hoping, hoping things change. <laughs> okay. We could just play if we could just play an international game. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Alan, what one thing that we've talked about a lot on the podcast, and something that's been, you know, a joy to see over the last couple of years, and seeing in yourself as well, is seeing guys from the continent getting opportunities that previously wouldn't have been there. You know, we're seeing the success of Pizzo, of Walid Ragagi. We're seeing you, Akola Turi, finally getting a job at Wigan. You know, we, we interviewed um, Radi Jaidi, who's now doing well at Circular Bruges. You know, Bradley Carnell's about this yeah. about you know, the MLS. So suddenly there's an explosion of coaching. You know, Benny's doing well yeah. at Man U, obviously. You know, for you, why, you know, you know, two questions, you know, why why do you think that's happened now and like why is the coaching kind of you know we've always seen the talent of football players but we haven't always seen the talent of football coaches from the continent and b you know do you think that the opportunities are starting to open up where you know once you know perhaps they weren't they weren't there yeah that's that's such a difficult question actually alistair to answer if i'm honest yeah 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 that's that that's a really good question uh and and for me I can only speak about my personal experience and say that um, I mentioned it before. I, I was getting really frustrated at the sort of stagnation that was happening in the PSL, and I wanted something more. I think we we started in South Africa to get such an influx of um, football information from 
the TV, from the footage that we get. Uh, we've had the taste of the World Cup and, and we get so much Champions League football, Europa League football, La Liga, uh, Serie A, you name it, Bundesliga, Premier League, we get all of it. And um, you want, as a coach, you want to implement your ideas and, and your uh, aspirations as a coach. Um, and you look for environments where you can do that. Uh, and if it's not in South Africa, then you have to look elsewhere. Um, and, and I think it also, it came at a time as well where you, we, in South Africa, we get such an influx of foreign coaches, um, and you go toe to toe with them in the PSL. And then you think to yourself, but I want to go and do it in your country, because if you came to my country, why can't I go to yours? Um, what's stopping me? Um, and maybe it takes a few coaches to move to, to give others a little bit of confidence. Um, to say, hey, man, I can do it too, you know, and you're right. We've got such incredible coaches around around the world. You mentioned Bradley, you mentioned Benny. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see South African coaches showing that on the global stage, they can hold their own against some of the best coaches in the world. Um, you know, so, so why not? Why not? Um, hopefully, you know, the world's also become a lot more of a global village. I think with the advent of internet and uh, uh, all the information that comes uh, comes across now around the world, you know, it makes the world a lot of a smaller place. So, you know, perhaps that's why. Um, difficult one to answer, Alice. The great question. I mean, uh, it's a question we have to keep wrestling with. I mean, my, my last question, Alan, is, you know, equally heavy and serious. You know, if you got the phone call today from from Spurs and from Bafana Bafana for that top job where which one are you choosing right now at the same time Spurs and Bafana Bafana no no, tr no one or the other yeah I, one or the other I don't even think it's a choice I'll be at uh you'll see me at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium on the weekend <laughs> can I just say something Helen and I don't know if you could help me with yeah that. sure how top world-class players do you know that have won nothing in the <laughs> <laughs> one. I'm not Harry Kane's agent, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm and this is what I'm worried about. I'm <laughs> a statistic, you know, because I, and I I don't know what's going on with Spurs. If I'm being genuinely honest, I don't know. Serial winners: Jose Marie, Conte, Pochettino. What he cultivated at Southampton made him the prime target for a team like Spurs. Why is this team not taking the next step? Why are they not also just competing like they were under Poch before he got the sack? Your thoughts, please. Oh, one is I'm not there yet. Um, <laughs> no, I'm only joking. <laughs> um, look, I, I love the football that we played on, under Pochettino. I think it was it was Tottenham's uh, DNA. I think it was Spurs. It's how we know Spurs, how I've known Spurs as a child. Um, we'd rather win 4-3 or lose 4-3 than win 1-0. Um, it was about attacking football, fast, entertaining football. Um, I must be honest, I'm a huge admirer of Jose Mourinho. Um, but when he was hired at Tottenham, I just... It just didn't feel right. It just didn't feel like he, him and the club had the same philosophy, game model. And I think that's so critical as a coach is that the institution or the environment that you work in, everybody has to buy into that idea. And I think it's a very similar outset with, with Conte. Um, I must tell you, so uh, Italy has a big influence on Albania, who has a big influence on Kosovo. So. The Italian way is very much inbred in, in this sort of part of the world. And it's a very defense-minded um, mentality. And that's that's not Tottenham. It, it's not Spurs. We're not a counter-attacking team. Uh, we're not an Atletico Madrid that wants to sit back and, and counter-attack. Counter um, Spurs are a team that always want the ball, uh, always want to attack. And under Pochettino, we had that. Um, I feel like we had an incredible squad with Pochettino when you look back at the team that he had. Um, and it's, it's hard, it's hard to put your finger on it because they, they are great coaches, Conte and Mourinho, but I, I, there's not a synergy it seems from the club and, and from the coach. Uh, there seems to be a disconnect. Um, I feel a lot of our purchases 
even recently now, um, I, 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 they, they just don't sit, they don't strike me as Spurs signings. They don't strike me as, as ones that would fit our way. I think we had the way under Pochettino and I, and I think we, we kind of, kind of took a shot left, like we say in South Africa, um, and tried to go the trophy route. But matched up with managers whose game models just don't reflect the club's idea or philosophies. Um, I think also the club's ambition needs to start matching the coaches as well. You know, we we're going to have to start spending some money in in terms of improving our squad with with quality rather than hopefuls. Um, I feel like sometimes Spurs are going into the markets hoping they strike another Gareth Bale, and you know they're stealing from Southampton for nothing and selling for 120 million, but. Yeah, I think with today's scouting networks um, and technology involved, it's very difficult to find things like that these days. Well, Alan, it's been a, a bit of joy listening to your, your analysis and, and your insight. I mean, I'm looking forward to the next time uh, we get you on the podcast. You'll be the head coach at Spurs <laughs> and maybe Bafana, uh, maybe Bafana as well. <laughs> but, and, if you, and if you listeners want to hear that podcast when Alan is at, at Spurs, you know, you know where to catch us, OTW underscore podcast. You can find us on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook and YouTube and Spotify. You can find us on, on The Whistle. And we now have started a TikTok ch- uh, account as well. Courtney still hasn't got downloaded the app. It's a bit too it's a bit too young for him, but we're on it. OTW underscore podcast. TikTok causes problems in my schools, Alistair. <laughs> That's enough of that chat. Alan, thank you so much for, for joining us. We've loved hearing your story as well as getting some of your insight and analysis. Same guys, thanks so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Lovely to see you guys. I wish you all the best and uh, we'll chat soon. Thank you very much, Alistair.